chapter 13. Half blinded by sweat dripping in my eyes, I followed Arthur through the gate and down a shady side road. Suddenly he veered across a patch of grass and vanished into a grove of trees. I was right behind him. Dragging our bikes with us, we crawled under a willow's long drooping branches. From our hiding place in the dark green shade, we watched for Silas. A woman walked by pushing a stroller. Three joggers passed her. A kid walking a dog stopped to talk to the woman. I don't think he's coming, I whispered. It could be a trick, Arthur said. We'd better sit tight for a while, just in case he's waiting for us to come out. The ground was bare and damp under the trees. Their roots spread out, humping above the earth into a network of comfortable sitting places. Morning doves sobbed. Cicadas thrummed, getting louder and softer, louder and softer, as if nothing else mattered. How did you ever find this place? I asked. Danny and his gang chased me into the cemetery once. This is where I hid, he said. I come here a lot now. It's a good place to read and think about stuff. But it's a cemetery, I reminded him. Doesn't that bother you? I'm more scared of living people than dead people, Arthur said. Considering our present circumstances, he definitely had a point. Cautiously, I parted the willow's long branches and peered out. I don't see Silas. We'd better stay here a while longer, just in case. Yeah, I turned my attention to my knee. It had stopped bleeding, but it was pretty dirty. I hoped I was right about it just being a little scrape. Otherwise, it could get infected and I could get septicemia and die. At least that would save Silas the trouble of killing me. Arthur reached into his shorts pocket, pulled out one of the library's maps and spread it on the ground between us. Along the magic forest winding paths, an illustrator had drawn and labeled all the park's attractions, rides, buildings, nursery rhyme figures, statues. He pointed at the picture of Old Mother Hubbard's cupboard. That was the refreshment stand. They had the best frozen custard in the whole world. Boy, I would love to have some right now. I studied the map, trying not to think how a double dip of frozen custard would cool my mouth and slide down my throat and fill my lunchless stomach. It's weird thinking all that stuff is hidden under kudzu now. The paths, the buildings, the statues, even with a map, I don't see how we'll find anything. Not everything's covered up. You saw those statues sticking out of the kudzu. Alice in Wonderland, the dish running away with the spoon, Humpty Dumpty, and Willie the Big Blue Whale. Arthur ran his finger along a path on the map. Look, there's a fence made of gingerbread men leading to the witch's hut. I'd forgotten all about that. They look just like the little plastic men. Arthur turned to me. Do you think Mrs. Donaldson was trying to tell Violet the briefcase was hidden near the hut? Maybe. I studied the drawing of the little hut. Is it still there? I haven't been to that part of the park since it closed, Arthur said. There's no way to know what's there unless we go and look. Unless we go and look? He made it sound as if the magic forest was our fate, our destiny. Go there and find the money or die trying. Arthur continued to study the map as if he intended to stay in the cemetery for hours, but I was getting restless. The root was starting to feel hard under my butt. I was hungry and thirsty and hot. I didn't want to think about the magic forest or the evidence or the murder anymore. Can we go home now? Arthur parted the willow's branches and we gazed out at the cemetery. The late afternoon sunlight cast long shadows across the grass. An old couple ambled past, walking a dog as ancient as they were. Otherwise, the place seemed to be deserted. We dragged our bikes from our hiding place, but before we rode away, Arthur paused to point out a statue of a woman and her little boy. The woman had an open book in her lap and the boy stood beside her, looking up into her calm marble face. That's Eleanor Beale and her son Arthur, he told me. Arthur, just like me. 
He touched Arthur Beale's marble shoe reverently. Eleanor was married to Robert Bradley Beale, the guy the town was named for. There's a statue of him in the park downtown. I sat on the seat of my bike, one foot on the pedal, ready to go. But Arthur went on talking in a quiet voice. I used to pretend Eleanor Beale was my mother and I was her little boy, and we were reading that book together. Sometimes, if no one was around, I'd even climb into her lap. Dumb, huh? What happened to your real mother, I asked. You never talk about her. Arthur leaned on his bike handlebars, his eyes on the statue's face. There's nothing to say. I've been living with Grandma since I was a baby. Is your mother dead? I asked softly. He shrugged. What difference does it make whether she's dead or alive? I never see her. She never calls. She never writes, not to me or Grandma. She's probably a drug addict or worse. I never heard anyone say such things about his mother. You don't care about her at all? Arthur gripped his handlebars so tightly his knuckles widened. She doesn't care about me. Why should I care about her? He glanced at me and I saw the glint of tears behind his glasses. Sad and embarrassed, I looked down at the gravel path. A line of black ants paraded by as if they were engaging in important business. How about your dad? My mother showed up one day at Grandma's house, Arthur went on as if he hadn't heard me. She had me with her, the infant, no explanations. A couple of weeks later, she left. Arthur bent his head over his handlebars and fiddled with his bike gears without me, and that was that. I tried to think of something to say, but nothing came to mind except stupid remarks like, that's awful. I patted his back silently, hoping he'd understand how bad I felt for him. It's okay, he muttered. Like I said, I don't care anymore. Without another word, he began pedaling away, leaving Mrs. Beale and her son to gaze forever at the same page in their stone book. Just to be safe, we rode home the back way, zipping down alleys and cutting across backyards. To our relief, we didn't meet Silas or anyone else. Mom was sitting on the porch reading a mystery novel as usual. When she saw me, she frowned. It's about time you got here, Logan. You missed lunch. And now it's almost time for dinner. Arthur poked his elbow in my side and gestured toward his yard. Violet's old car was parked out front. May sat on the grass making clover chain. And Danny was tossing a ball for Bear to catch. He looked happier than usual. From the porch steps, Mrs. Jenkins called. Come on over here, Arthur. Bring Logan with you. I glanced at Mom. Sure, she'd order me inside that she was lost in her book again. Reluctantly, Arthur and I headed toward his house. Danny stopped tossing the ball and stared at us. Just because I'm staying here doesn't mean I'm your friend or nothing. He kept his voice low, too low for Mrs. Jenkins to hear. I assure you the feeling is mutual, Arthur said, affecting an English accent for reasons known only to him. Danny scowled, you're weird. You know what? Nuts. Crazy. Arthur shoved his glasses back up to the bridge of his nose. At least I'm not stupid. By now, Mrs. Jenkins was crossing the lawn, a big smile on her face. Logan, have you met Danny? Before I could answer, Arthur said, Logan had the dubious pleasure of meeting Danny at the toot and tote. They say two's company and three's a crowd but I'm sure you boys will get along just fine. Mrs. Jenkins smiled again, clearly determined to see things in the most optimistic light. Come inside and cool off with some soda. May slipped her clover chain over her head and followed us into the kitchen. Violet was sitting at the table, her chin propped on her hand, her eyes sad and distant. The little girl pulled the clover chain off and gave it to Violet. I made this for you because you're pretty and I love you. Thank you, May. Violet hugged her daughter. That's very sweet of you. For some reason, she looked as if she was about to cry. Mrs. Jenkins patted her shoulder. 
You're lucky to have such a sweet child. Violet nodded, looking even more tearful. Danny came inside with Bear. When we go home, he told Arthur and me, this dog's coming with us. Oh no, he's not, Arthur said. We've been taking care of him since you're... Catching a warning look from Mrs. Jenkins, Arthur left his sentence hanging. Bear's my dog. Danny turned to his mother, isn't he? Violet shook her head. We can't afford a dog, you know that. Danny slumped at the table, his legs stuck out, his face ugly. I never get nothing I want, he muttered. Violet reached out to pat his arm, but he jerked away from her. In the silence, Mrs. Jenkins busied herself handing out sodas. Pointing to an open bag of cookies, she said, help yourselves. The whole time we ate and drank, no one said anything except May. Climbing onto her mother's lap, she whispered, don't be sad, Mommy. I'm not sad. Violet blew a nose on the tissue Mrs. Jenkins handed her. Nobody was fooled, not even May, who sat there quietly and stroked Violet's arm, her face almost as unhappy as her mother's. Violet turned to me suddenly and forced herself to smile. Mom's house looks much better now, like it did when I was little, she sighed. I hated seeing it so tumbled down. I'll tell Dad you like it, I said. He's been doing a lot of work. Violet blew her nose again. I stole a glance at Danny. He sat there eating his cookies as if they were his enemies, biting into them fiercely, chewing hard and swallowing noisily. He didn't look at anyone and he didn't say a word. Finally, I heard Mom calling me to come home. Glad to escape, I excused myself and headed for the back door. Arthur followed me outside. There's only one extra room, he muttered. Violet and May must be sleeping there. You know what that means? You get a roommate. It's not funny, Arthur glared at me. How would you like to sleep in the same bed as Danny Phelps? Just be glad it's not Silas. With that, I took a flying leap from the porch and darted through the gap in the hedge. See you tomorrow. I shouted at Arthur, but he just looked at me, his face glum. Chapter 14 After dinner, I was watching an old Sopranos rerun when the phone rang. Thinking it might be Arthur, I ran to answer it. To my amazement, it was Nina. First of all, she asked if my knee was okay. I couldn't believe she called just to ask about a cut, but I told her it was fine. Mom had doused it with something that stung like mad, and then she slapped a big band-aid on it. They won't have to amputate after all, I joked. Nina laughed politely and asked if she could speak to Mom. Did you find out something new about the murder, I asked? No, she said. I just want to talk to her. There was something odd about her voice. With some misgiving, I handed the phone to Mom and went back to the living room. On TV, a bunch of guys were shooting at each other from speeding cars. The noise of the show drowned out Mom's conversation with Nina. After a while, Mom walked into the living room and turned off the TV. Hey, what are you doing, I asked. I'm watching that. I want to talk to you, she said, right now. She stood over me, her arms folded across her chest. I didn't like the look she had on her face. She knew something. I was sure of it, but I didn't know what. The situation made me very uncomfortable. Nina Stevens just told me you and Arthur got into trouble at the library today. My heart dropped to the bottom of my belly. She wasn't there. How could she possibly? Someone told her all about it. Nina knows Mrs. Bunyans. I stared at Mom, amazed. Doesn't matter who told her, she said. What matters is that you and Arthur slung file folders all over the library and scattered maps and pamphlets on the floor. Then you vandalized the men's room. My amazement turned to disbelief. Nina told you this? And that's not all. You stole valuable material from the local history file. Mom stared at me. Her eyes filled with tears. Oh, Logan, how could you behave like that? You were brought up properly. You come from a good home. Wait, wait, I held my hands up. All Arthur and I did, 
Arthur, Arthur, Arthur. Mom spoke so loudly, I was scared Arthur would think she was calling him and come running. Do you know how sick I am of seeing that boy stuffing my food into his face? He has no manners. He comes and goes as if he lived here. He, but Mom, I don't want that boy in my yard or in my house. I stared at her, bewildered by her anger. What do you mean? He's my only... Nina is also concerned about your friendship with him, Mom cut in. She and I agree it would be best for you to... Don't believe Nina. She's lying. She... Arthur is off limits. Mom talked right over me, as relentless as a steamroller flattening asphalt. His grandmother pays no attention to where he goes or what he does, and he drags you along with him. He's a bad influence, a... She caught her breath, her face red with anger. Let's just say Arthur is not the sort of boy I want my son to associate with. If you continue to hang out with him, you'll have no friends in middle school. Is that what you want, to be a misfit like Arthur? I stared at Mom in disbelief. Please don't do this, I begged her. Nina must be crazy. She... Dad poked his head into the living room. What's Logan done now? He spoke in a joking way but mom wasn't in the mood for his humor. Go to bed, she told me. We'll talk about this in the morning. Knowing it was useless to argue, I dragged myself upstairs. Instead of getting into bed, I sat on the windowsill and tried to get my mind around Nina's motives for telling mom a pack of lies. I was sure she hadn't been in the library to witness Arthur's and my behavior. Nor did I think Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Bailey would concoct a story like that about Arthur and me. So who, what, why? And then it came to me, the only explanation. Silas had told Nina about Arthur's and my behavior in the library. Silas. Nina knew Silas. She'd believed everything he'd told her. Utterly miserable, I sat and stared at Arthur's dark house. I'd liked Nina. I trusted her. I admired her. And what had she done but betray Arthur and me with lies? I never wanted to see her again. The next morning, I rushed downstairs in time to see Arthur standing at the kitchen door. Mom faced him, her back to me, her shoulders squared. If I dared to hope she was over being mad, I was wrong. I'm sorry, she was saying, but Logan and I have something to do today. Like what? Arthur pressed his face against the screen, but Mom didn't invite him in. Maybe I could come too, he said. I don't have anything special planned. Not today. But you heard me, Mom said in her coldest voice. Arthur turned away as if he knew the game was up. From the back, his shoulder blades poked against his faded t-shirt. Mom, I began, but she shut me up by grabbing my arm and hustling me out of the kitchen. What's the matter with you, I yelled. You were really rude to Arthur. He's my friend, and Mom gave me a little shake. I told you last night you are not to associate with Arthur, but she held out her hand. Give me what you took from the pamphlet file, Logan. Then we'll go to the library, and you can return it with apologies. Despite myself, I turned away. I don't have it, I muttered. Mom tilted my chin up so I had to face her. Look me in the eye and say that, Logan. Arthur has it. I was telling the truth, or at least part of it. Mom shifted her attention to my cargo shorts. What's in your pocket? Nothing. I backed away, but Mom grabbed my arm. Show me, she said. Reluctantly, I produced the map. It's just an old, she snatched it and saw the library stamp. Oh, Logan, she said, I am so disappointed in you. You don't understand, Mom. If you make me take it back to the library, these really bad guys will get it. That's why we took it, to keep them from finding. Mom stared at me as if she'd never seen me before. Is this some craziness Arthur dreamed up? Why can't you trust me? I was yelling now, but I didn't care. Why take Nina's word over mine? I'm your son. Stop shouting at me, Logan. Dad came to the kitchen door. 
He was holding a brush dripping with moss green paint. Johnny was right behind him, Dad's shadow. What's going on now, Dad asked. Mom waved the map at Dad. Your son stole this from the library. He and Arthur. Dad looked at the map and then at me, obviously puzzled. Why did you take some useless thing like this? Behind him, Johnny stared at me with interest, but I kept my mouth shut. I wasn't about to say anything important in front of him. Arthur's been a terrible influence on Logan, Mom told Dad, eager to blame my one and only friend for everything. Stop picking on Arthur, I yelled. That's enough, Mom said. Come along now. As Mom rushed me outside and into the car, I heard Johnny say, I told him to dump Arthur. Nobody likes that kid. He's weird, crazy. When we pulled away from the house, I saw Arthur sitting on his front steps, shoulders hunched, watching us glumly. I waved and he lifted his hand in farewell. Behind him, Danny sulked in the doorway, his nose pressed it to the screen. Bear sat beside him. Although I argued with mom all the way to the library, she paid no attention to a word I said. She made her plans, set her goals, organized her priorities. Nothing would alter her decision. Mrs. Bailey and Mrs. Jones were chatting at the information desk. When they saw me, they smiled and said hi, which they surely wouldn't have done if Arthur and I were guilty of the things Nina had accused us of doing. I'm Logan's mother, Carolyn Forbes, Mom said. Logan has come to apologize for his behavior yesterday. Before I could say a word, Mrs. Jones said, Logan and Arthur were just horsing around, acting silly. I gave them some work to do, and then they went on their way. They didn't vandalize anything, Mom asked. No, of course not. They're good kids, Mrs. Bailey put in. It's been so nice to see Arthur with a friend. Mom looked surprised to hear this, but she went on with her agenda anyway. Logan has something to return to you. Red-faced, I handed the Magic Forest map to Mrs. Jones. I took this, I mumbled. I'm sorry, but Mrs. Jones looked at the map. For heaven's sakes, I've been searching all over for this. A man asked for one yesterday. We're supposed to have several, but I couldn't find any of them. She paused and stared at me. Why didn't you make a photocopy? I didn't have any money, I said, and we, the librarians glanced at each other. Does Arthur by any chance have the other maps? Mrs. Jones asked. I don't mean to be rude, I said, but Arthur's my friend and I can't tell on him. He's not your friend anymore, Mom said. Turning to Mrs. Jones, she added, I suggest you call Arthur's grandmother if you want the rest of the maps. As she led me away, I asked her why she didn't just call the police. Maybe they'd send me to jail and you wouldn't have to put up with me any longer. It's not a bad idea, she snapped in sort of a joking way. On the way to the car, she stopped to look in the dry cleaner's window. What are all these posters about saving Magic Forest? I thought a big development was planned for the property. Arthur says a lot of people in town don't want a zillion newcomers moving in here. Mom frowned at the sound of Arthur's name. In Rhoda's opinion, the people opposed to it are fighting progress. What's wrong with a population increase? We'll have a larger tax base, better schools, decent places to shop and eat. I felt like saying Rhoda was a worse influence on mom than Arthur was on me. But what was the use? She'd just get mad. The bulldozing scheduled to begin soon, mom went on. I don't think there's much hope of saving the magic. We got back in the car. The seats were so hot from the sun, I expected to get second-degree burns on the back of my legs. Are we going home now? Mom shook her head. I talked to Rhoda last night. She has a son your age, and we thought it would be fun to get you two together. School begins in a couple of weeks. Wouldn't it be nice to make a new friend? I already have a friend, I muttered. A grim look settled on Mom's face. Full of resolution, she headed the car out of town and into Fair Oaks, which meant passing between two curving stone walls. I expected an armed guard to stop us and demand to see our IDs. Big houses with huge windows and multi-level decks sat in the middle of landscape lots. 
The grass was a uniform green. The trees and flower beds were planted in symmetrical perfection and neighborhood watch signs sprouted on every corner. After negotiating a series of winding streets with names like Trembling Aspen, Summer Hat, and Woven Fancy, Mom finally stopped in front of a big stone-fronted house with hanging flower baskets swaying from the porch rafters. Rhoda waved from the front door. Come in, come in, she called. Glad to see you, Logan. I've heard so much about you. She shook my hand firmly. Her hair was colored, even I could tell that. And she wore makeup and expensive clothes and lots of jewelry, too. Though I hated to agree with anything Billy Jarman said, she really did look slick enough to sell George's picture off a $1 bill. She led us into air-conditioned perfection of the sort you encounter in model houses where no one lives. Everything smelled new. No mess, nothing out of place. In other words, the interior was even more boring than the exterior. Mom looked around, taking in the ivory carpet and the dried flower arrangements and the furniture. Oh, Rhoda, it's beautiful. I love it. Rhoda smiled modestly. I'm sure your darling little house has much more charm and think of its potential. It's a work in progress, Mom said. It takes Hank forever to finish anything. He and Johnny are still painting the exterior. Heaven knows when they'll get around to the rest of the house. Tell me about it, Rhoda rolled her eyes, obviously agreeing that all men were undependable, unreliable, and slow. Well now, Rhoda turned to me. The boys are in the family room playing video games. Reluctantly, I followed her down a flight of carpeted steps to a large room with sliding glass doors. Outside, a deck bloomed with potted plants and more hanging flower baskets. Here's Logan, Rhoda called to the three boys crowded around a large screen computer where action heroes dashed through a labyrinth, lobbing fireballs at menacing hooded figures, popping up here and there. The graphics were incredible, but the game itself seemed to be based on the same old formula of good guys and bad guys going at each other with loud sounds and spurts of blood and brains. The boys got to their feet slowly and faced Rhoda and me. Logan, this is my son Anthony, she said. Boys, meet Logan Forbes from Richmond. A tall boy with dark hair smiled politely. Glad you could come over, Logan. He sounded as if his mother had told him what to say. These two young men live in the neighborhood, Rhoda went on. Robert Oliver and Mackenzie Stone. They're practically part of the family. Robert was shorter than I was, but huskier. Mackenzie had curly hair and freckles. He was about my height. Like Anthony, they mouthed polite greetings. One look and I knew all three. They were good at sports. They wore the right clothes. They had the right haircuts. They were full of whatever it is that makes you popular. We're playing my new video game, Anthony began, but his mother interrupted him. Let's turn that off now, boys, she said. I've made a pitcher of lemonade. Go out on the deck and I'll bring it to you. With some reluctance, Anthony left the computer and led the way outside. I hear you live in the murder house, he said, as we all sat down around a big table with a glass top. I nodded, once again reminded that my house was famous all over town, even out here in Fair Oaks. It must be creepy, Mackenzie said. I'd hate to live there, Robert put in. And not just because of the murder, Anthony said. You know who Logan's next door neighbors are. The boys looked at him. Who? asked Mackenzie. Arthur Jenkins and his fruitcake grandmother. All three laughed and groaned and carried on. Rhoda chose that moment to appear with the tray. Setting down four frosty glasses of lemonade, she smiled. Look at you all, laughing like old friends already. As soon as his mother left, Anthony said, Arthur is the weirdest kid in Billsville. How do you stand living next door to him? Here was my opportunity to turn my back on Arthur and make friends with Anthony, Robert, and Mackenzie. 
A few weeks ago, I would have jumped at the chance, but now I found myself remembering that guys like them never liked me. Sooner or later, they'd dump me. Maybe I'd fumble the ball or strike out in a big game or say something dumb. They'd decide I was socially inept, a nerd, a creep, a weirdo like Arthur. But Arthur, well, Arthur was Arthur. He didn't care about clothes or haircuts or striking out. He loved books and riding his hopeless old bike and doing interesting stuff. Best of all, he was never boring. Irritating, maybe, but not boring. And he lived right next door, not miles away in a big fancy house. Before answering, I swallowed a mouthful of lemonade, fresh squeezed, not made from a mix. It was so sweet, it made my jaw ache. Arthur's not bad, I said. You like Arthur Jenkins? Anthony and his friends looked at me as if I'd just confessed to something totally gross, like ordering ice cream with olives and anchovies on top. Well, yeah, he's okay, I blundered on, despite their incredulous stares. In fact, we're trying to figure out who killed Mrs. Donaldson, I added, hoping they'd find that so interesting they'd change their opinion of Arthur. The three exchanged glances and started laughing. It was probably Arthur's grandmother, Mackenzie said. She looks like an ax murderer, Robert added, snickering. I tell you seriously, Logan, you'd better not hang out with Arthur at school, Anthony said. Mackenzie laughed. It'll be you and Arthur against the world. The three stared at me, waiting to see if I'd change my mind about Arthur. But how could I? I remembered how sad he'd looked watching me ride off in Mom's car. Plus, I knew full well these guys had no genuine interest in being friends with me. I was there because Anthony's mother, and with some input from my mother, had invited me. I shrugged and looked down at my running shoes. The same brand as theirs, but not the same style. Not the right style. Back in Richmond, I was used to hanging out around the edges of things. Here, it seemed even the edges would be out of my reach. As Arthur Jenkins' sidekick, I was doomed to be way, way out there on a distant planet of no interest to anyone. I hear your dad's the new art teacher at Bill High, Anthony said, mercifully changing the subject. Yeah. I guess that's why you live in Arthur's neighborhood, Mackenzie said. I looked at him and frowned, not sure of the connection. Robert sighed. Teachers can't afford to live out here, not on their salaries. I looked from one boy to the other. They sat back in their chairs, grinning, waiting to hear my reply. That was another thing about popular guys. Nothing I said would bother them. They knew they were my superiors. What was the use of trying to talk to them? So I just shrugged and reached for my glass of lemonade. Mackenzie put down his empty glass and got to his feet. Anybody ready to finish that game? The other two followed him inside. Nobody asked if I wanted to play, so I stayed where I was and wished my mother would take me home. This had to be one of the worst mornings of my life. Chapter 15 Unfortunately, the day wasn't over. A few minutes later, Rhoda called down to announce lunch was ready. The three guys ran upstairs ahead of me, pushing and shoving each other to see who'd get to the top first, laughing and joking in a mindless jock way. Rhoda and Mom had set up lunch on the upper deck. A platter of roast beef sandwiches and turkey wraps sat in the middle of the table. A tin tub full of ice held enough sodas for 20 or 30 people. On the side were bowls of tossed salad, potato salad, and strawberries, as well as a plate of brownies. If Arthur had seen all the food, he would have thought he'd died and gone to heaven. But he wasn't here. It was just me and three guys who'd already decided I was a total loser. We all sat down. Mom smiled happily at me. I knew she was thinking, isn't this more fun than hanging out with Arthur? She saw what she wanted to see. Me, Logan, making friends with popular guys. 
instead of the truth. Me, Logan, having a miserable time with popular guys. While the other boys laughed and joked, I ate my turkey wrap silently. It didn't taste nearly as good as it looked, or maybe it was just me. Every now and then I glanced at mom, hoping she'd notice things weren't going as well as she'd hoped. But she was too busy yakking with Rhoda to notice I was miserable. Suddenly, Rhoda turned to me with a big smile. So Logan, she said in her cheerful voice, what sports do you play? Anthony, Robert, and Mackenzie have been playing soccer since they were born, practically. They're great in track, too. Anthony broke a record for the 50-yard dash last year, and Mackenzie's a fantastic pole vaulter. Oh, and Robert, Robert, how could I leave you out? Wait till you see him throw that shot put thing. Unbelievable. She raised her soda can to toast the boys. They bowed and grinned and jostled each other. As a result, Robert spilled his soda on my leg. Sorry, Lo, he said. So what sport, Logan? What position? Rhoda persisted. With those long legs, I bet you're a runner, too. Or maybe basketball's your thing. Mackenzie's really great on the court. Poetry in motion. High score almost every game. I don't do anything special, I admitted. In fact, I will, I... In other words, your position is spectator, Anthony said. Except for Mom and me, everyone laughed. Rhoda turned to Mom. My son has a fantastic sense of humor, doesn't he? So quick on the uptake. His grandfather thinks he's funny enough to be on TV. Mom nodded, but she had her eye on me, as if she was finally beginning to realize lunch was not a big success. Somehow I finished my wrap, ate some salad, and choked down a brownie. When Anthony led his friends downstairs to resume their game, no one invited me to go with them. Not that I wanted to. Luckily, Mom and Rhoda were too busy cleaning up to notice me sitting alone in a corner of the living room, reading the only printed material I could find, this week's TV guide. Out in the kitchen, I heard Rhoda say, You should encourage him to play a sport. It's the only way to survive middle school. Logan's not a natural athlete, Mom said. Frankly, he'd rather read. A loner, Rhoda said as if she were pronouncing my death sentence. No, not a loner, Mom said quickly, just not a team player. Same thing, Rhoda said. They moved out of hearing range, leaving me to imagine myself growing up to be a miserable failure, alone, friendless, unwanted. At last, Mom came out of the kitchen, purse in hand, and I followed her and Rhoda to the car. The boys stayed downstairs. I could hear muffled explosions as the heroes fought the bad guys. As I opened the car door, Rhoda gave me a pat on the back. Anthony and his friends just can't get enough of that silly game. Maybe you should take it up yourself. She paused. That or basketball. You'll be amazed at the different sports make in your life. Yeah, I eased into the car. Before I could close the door, Rhoda added, don't keep your nose in a book. You won't make friends that way. This time I didn't say anything, but I did try to smile. A poor effort, I'm sure. Mom thanked Rhoda for a lovely lunch and promised to call her soon. At last, we were backing down the long driveway, waving to Rhoda, saying goodbye. We hadn't gone more than a block when Mom said, You didn't even try, did you? Mom, I don't have anything in common with guys like that. She frowned at the big houses we were passing. I simply don't understand you, Logan. I didn't answer. I thought you'd have fun. I thought you'd make friends. I thought, well, you thought wrong. And that was that as far as conversation was concerned. We rode home in silence, not the comfortable kind either. Mom was mad and I was mad. Worse yet, she was disappointed which made me feel guilty for letting her down. When we pulled into the driveway, Mom said, I'm sorry today wasn't more fun for you, Logan. She hesitated a moment. But you have to make an effort. We've been invited to Rhoda's for a party on Saturday. Maybe this time you and Anthony. Mom, I interrupted. It won't matter how hard I try. Kids like Anthony hate kids like me. 
Just try, please. Mom looked at me with worried eyes. Try, Logan. That's all I ask. My eyes strayed to Arthur's house. The grass was a foot taller than ours, and a shutter hung crookedly at an upstairs window. For the first time, I realized how sad his house looked, especially now that Johnny and Dad had almost finished painting ours and whipping the lawn into shape. Mom sighed. If you don't like Anthony, find someone you do like, a nice boy from a good home. Not, she didn't need to finish the sentence. We both knew what she meant. Someone who's popular, plays sports, gets good grades, fits in. Someone whose father makes big bucks. Someone who lives in a fancy house. Disconsolately, I followed mom inside, achingly aware, Arthur's eyes watching me from somewhere. I spent the rest of the day moping around the house and getting in everyone's way. Now and then I glanced out a window and saw Arthur reading on his front porch or tinkering with the Raleigh in his backyard. Mrs. Jenkins puttered around in her flower garden, weeding and pruning, singing old songs in a low monotone. May tagged along behind her, trying to help. I guessed Violet was at work and Danny was with his friends. Neither Mrs. Jenkins nor Arthur looked at our house. Mom had most likely offended both of them. That made me even sadder. I put food out for Bear the way I always did, but he seemed to be avoiding us too. Mom didn't miss him, but Dad mentioned him several times, even asked if I'd filled his bowl. Wordlessly, I pointed to the untouched kibble. The next morning, neither Arthur nor Bear showed up at breakfast time. I spent a long, boring day tagging along with Mom to a big shopping outlet about 20 miles away. She insisted on buying me shirts and shorts like the ones Anthony and his friends wore. She made me get a haircut like theirs and shoes like theirs. At last, she let me buy some science fiction paperbacks at a huge place called Book Warehouse. That was the only good part of the day, except lunch. The next day, I put on my Anthony clothes and Mom and I drove all the way to Washington, D.C. It was the hottest day of the entire summer, 99 degrees, with humidity so thick you could hardly breathe. And here, Mom and I were dragging ourselves from one air-conditioned museum to the next. Air and space, natural history, American history, American Indian, National Gallery of Art. After a while, we were so exhausted, we collapsed on a black leather sofa and stared at a seascape by Winslow Homer. The cool green water looked real enough to jump into except for the sharks swimming around the boat. They reminded me of Silas and Billy. I sat there in the museum dressed like a fake friend of Anthony and wondered if Silas had found the evidence that revealed the killer's name, his own probably. <laughs>